Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is State Representative Rena Moran, District 65A in St. Paul. Yesterday's news in the Chauvin trial was certainly welcome. But when Black men, women, girls, and boys continue to lose their lives at the hand of law enforcement, hearing one man rule guilty only provides limited comfort. Last summer, we started a difficult work to ensure people in communities like mine can have safe, respectful interactions with law enforcement, along with the accountability and justice they deserve. In this bill, we continue the important reforms to ensure that our state public safety framework has human rights and human dignity at the forefront. As we advance a state budget, invested in public safety is one of our core responsibilities. Through the reforms and investment in this budget, House DFLers are moving us closer to realizing true public safety for all Minnesotans, no matter where they live or what they look like. And with that, I will pass it on to Chair Mariani. Need you to unmute, Carlos. Thank you, uh, Chair Moran. Uh, yesterday actually was not the end. A lot of people think that it is. Um, it's actually, it was actually one step. It was a very important step, but only one step of the big work that lies ahead of us. George should be alive today. We need systems that maximize and, and uh, makes that possible, especially for our black men and women in our society, for people of color in our society. Uh, Minnesotans have every right to have their human rights and dignity respected by their entire government, including our law enforcement communities. The bill that we're going to be hearing today has several important reform uh, provisions in it. And our approach as House DFLers, frankly, is to both push uh, reform for accountability, for transparency, for citizen involvement, uh, in the management of, of, of our uh, reviewing our, our behaviors and our actions in law enforcement, uh, making sure we have strong licensing practices at our state, but also resourcing our law enforcement, our public safety, to make sure that they have the tools so that when good practices and good officers are doing the tough work, they know we have their back and we know they have our back. And so I'm really looking forward to the debate today on a number of issues ranging from body cameras to uh, de-escalation work uh, to no-knock warrants, uh, vital, vital, important work for us to do today. And with that, I'll, uh, I believe, uh, Representative Frazier. Thank you, Chair Mariani. And I think you, were, you, you, you correctly pointed out that um, the verdict from the trial yesterday is just one piece of this puzzle that we're trying to put together to make sure that all Minnesotans have a, a public safety system that works well for everyone, that values the lives of everyone, and particularly our black and brown members of our community that have for so long uh, not had that valuation um, to the same extent of our other community members. Um, you know, the, the, the bills that we are moving forward should not be controversial. These are common sense things. These are things that anyone in this profession that wanna make sure that the profession keeps the most honorable members in the profession and truly protect and serve should want these things to go through and should want these passed into law. We're talking about enhancing community oversight to make sure that the community that you protect and serve has more input and can work together with you to build more trust and to make sure you're protected and to serve them well. We're talking about rooting out hate groups. No one wants that within their profession. We're talking about strengthening compliance reviews to make sure that our law enforcement agencies are staying up to date with their model policies and following those model policies. And if they're not, they can get the help they need from our licensing board. We're talking about improving officer accountability. That is one of the main things we have here. That is what we saw yesterday with the verdict in the Chauvin trial. That is what we wanna make sure we have because that goes a long way in improving the trust and the connection that our officers have with our community. I'm looking forward to debating this bill. I'm looking forward to seeing more action from our GOP colleagues and as well from our Senate once we move this bill out of the House. Thank you. Uh, 
Right. So Chair Jamie Becker Finn of the Judiciary Committee, uh, at the heart of this bill really is improving access to justice for all Minnesotans in many ways. Um, on the judiciary sections in the bill, we improve access to legal representation in our court system uh, for parents and child protection proce proceedings, increasing funding to public defenders, increasing access to court interpreters. Uh, we also expand important protections from discrimination, including long overdue updates to the hate crime statute, uh, reducing discrimination ba based on past pay or for people who need public assistance to pay for housing. Um, finally, we make really important steps towards decriminalizing poverty, including reducing the impact of fines and fees for those who are financially unable to pay them, and ending traffic stops based solely on petty misdemeanor violations such as expired tabs or having something hanging from your mirror. Uh, this bill also includes a reform of civil asset forfeiture and long overdue improvements to protections for victims of violent crime. Access to justice should not depend on a person's income, and our bill makes steps towards addressing that. This overall bill is focused on justice and equity and will positively impact the lives of many Minnesotans. Members should uh, be proud to vote for this really, uh, really important bill that's gonna make lives better for a lot of people. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Representative Moeller to talk about the criminal sexual conduct uh, reform that's in this bill. Hi, I'm Kelly Moeller and I represent District 42A and I live in Shoreview. And I'm really excited about the reform provisions in this bill, especially those that provide justice for survivors of sexual assault. The recent Supreme Court decision made clear what many of us already knew, and that was that our laws did not provide um, accountability and justice for survivors of sexual assault. Survivors have been telling us this for years and their advocates, and they, after a couple of years, got together and gave us a set of recommendations, and this bill incorporates those recommendations. They will, uh, the recommendations include closing the loophole for voluntary intoxication cases, providing more justice for 13-year-old victims, and creating a crime of sexual extortion. Survivors also told us for the need to eliminate the statute of limitations for prosecution of sexual assault cases. And we also had survivor driven provision related to National Guard members and having the BCA investigate sexual assaults committed by and against Guard members. So this is a bill that everybody can be proud of and that provides justice to a lot of Minnesotans. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us again on short notice. I'm um, Melissa Hartman, service speaker of the Minnesota House of Representatives. And when we heard the guilty verdict yesterday, I expected to feel happy. And I didn't. I just felt empty. And I still have uh, that pain and uh, heaviness in my in my chest and my stomach. And I think many Minnesotans do. And, and the reason is nothing uh, that the court can do will bring George Floyd back. And I don't think I'm gonna feel any better about Minnesota until we see some changes where we don't have to be mourning the loss of George Floyd and using uh, a person's death as a catalyst to make changes that should have been made a long, long time ago. And the heartache uh, of a family losing their 20 year old son um, just a short time ago, it, you know, this is all still very fresh with all of us, this pain. Um, I'm so grateful to Chair Moran and Chair Mariani for their partnership in the work last summer when we set out to show uh, communities of color and people all over the state who were protesting and coming out, speaking up, that we heard them. We heard the cries for justice. We were pushing the Minnesota Senate, led by Republicans, as hard as we could I think one of the most important reforms we adopted last summer was changing the standard on deadly force from a subjective standard to an objective standard, uh, but it's not enough. There is more that needs to be done. It's clearly not enough because of what happened with Dante Wright. So the, the work that we're doing on the floor today is about saving lives. It's about improving uh, police community relations in Minnesota. Uh, for a lot of us, um, you know, Minnesota was a place that we bragged about when we would travel around uh, other parts of the country, other parts of the world. And in recent years, it's really hard to brag when we have these disparities um, that we can't justify. We, we just can no longer tolerate. 
the time for action ha has been here. Uh, it's been here firmly staring us in the face since we lost Orlando Castile. Um, and the moment is now. And I am hopeful that Minnesota Republicans will join with Minnesota Democrats and that we can in a bipartisan way take a step forward and uh, make Minnesota a better place to be if you're a person of color, a safer place to be if you're a person of color. And we really respect and appreciate the public service of law enforcement officers who respect the human and constitutional rights of the people that they serve. Uh, we, we laud their bravery. They are people who we call when something goes bump in the night and, and we appreciate that service. We want only the best in the profession and we want them to live up to the highest standards that we have for anybody in public service. With that, I'll turn it over to the majority leader. Good afternoon, my name is Ryan Winkler. I'm the majority leader of the Minnesota House. The bill that we are bringing forward today is the kind of public safety that Minnesotans want. Minnesotans want to be able to trust their police department. They want to be able to trust police officers. They want to believe that a system exists for holding people accountable when they do wrong. Yesterday, we had a moment of justice in Minneapolis after that trial verdict was announced. But it isn't a moment that we are looking forward to make justice real in Minnesota. It is a journey. We have been on that journey in the House DFL for years under the leadership of Carlos Mariani, Representative Moran, and others who have really prioritized equity in our agenda, but particularly on the issue of criminal justice reform. Today, we are taking up a bill that is another step in that journey. We will not solve the problem of police brutality. We will not make every Minnesotan safe. We will not stop the problem of racism in our criminal justice system by passing one bill today or even enacting all of these provisions into law. It took decades or centuries to build up the kind of system that we have today and it will take time to undo it, but we can do it. Yesterday, Mahmoud Noor presented a jobs bill and he said that if we dream big, we can achieve big. If we dream small, we will achieve small. We are dreaming big about the kind of public safety Minnesotans should be able to have. We are trying to take a moment in which we are horrified, which we, but we cannot look away from and use it as a opportunity to rededicate ourselves to achieving a big dream of public safety for all Minnesotans. That's what this bill represents today. We believe it is what Minnesotans want and we call on our Republican colleagues in the House and in the Senate to join us along this journey. Senate Republicans, met us partway last year. We were able to get some work done last summer through heroic efforts under really difficult circumstances. And we can do that again today, but only if they come to the table in good faith and recognize that we have a system that harms and kills people and it needs to change. And I think with that, we are open to a conversation or with two questions. Yep, our first question is from Brian Bax. Go ahead. Hi there, I have actually one question that jumps off of uh, uh, Leader Winkler's comments and then one more specific on, on an item in the bill, but uh, Chair Mariani, how, how worried are you about people who finally feel like they were heard and achieved uh, justice in the courtroom feeling let down if they can't find uh, kind of willing, if you can't find willing partners to get some of these things through at the Capitol? I, uh, I actually do worry about that. Um, um, and, and it's, and I also <clears throat> excuse me, I also celebrate it because I think what we're seeing is a very aware, increasingly aware, um, and sophisticated uh, citizenry uh, in Minnesota. People, someone said it earlier. People are are waking up, um, and they're seeing the need for a better system. Um, and to the degree that our, um, whether it's the legislature or our local law enforcement doesn't respond to that, uh, that just erodes the trust. Uh, I think most people get it that we're not gonna hit home runs here, uh, left and right, that there has to be a really careful uh, deliberation and conversation and relationship building, but there has to be movement. And so, yes, the verdict was important, uh, but as I said, uh, it was only one step. It's really the beginning, not the end. And I think a lot of Minnesotans understand that and their expectations of us, of all of us are, are pretty high. 
if I can, if I can just jump in there, I'd like, I'd like to add, you know, we, we can't be foolish in this moment and we can't let this moment pass us by. This is a moment where we have to act. We cannot continue to have groups defending the status quo. The status quo has seen nothing but a series of black men lose their lives to the hands of law enforcement. If we don't act now, what we're saying is we're okay with the status quo. That is not good for Minnesota residents. That is not good for our law enforcement officers that are putting their lives on the line every day to protect our communities and we must act. So I, I charge and I challenge our GOP counterparts in our house and our GOP colleagues in the Senate. We have to act now because if we don't act, we're saying we're okay with the status quo. And the status quo simply says that these lives don't matter. Black and brown lives don't matter when they're taken by law enforcement because we're not gonna do anything to change that. We have to act. And the question I had on the specifics in the bill relates to the traffic stop uh, portion. Uh, a lot of these seem like they're kind of objective measures as to what types of things that won't amount to a traffic stop, but how worried are you about the subjective element to policing where the police might actually just find another reason to make a stop if they wanted to make that stop? I think that's I think that's a really good question. Um, the the idea is you know we can only control what we can do as legislators. We can implement laws to impact policy and try as best we can to control what's happening out there in the real world. Um, that's exactly what this law is intended to do. Is intended to narrow and limit those interactions as best we can. Now we do have some language in our bill that deals with uh, with our post board that deal with compliance reviews, and part of those compliance reviews will be looking at the frequency of these stops and the information around these stops and collecting data on who's being stopped and what they're being stopped for. So we're hoping that we'll catch, we'll look at that data and we'll look at those trends and we'll see who's proportionally being stopped and if it's for valid reasons. So we, again, we have to take action because we have measures in this language, in these bills that can help change this system for a better system for all, all Minnesotans, and particularly our black and brown people who have not had that. All right, Bill Werner, you're next, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Ted. Two part question, I'll ask, ask the second part first, and that is which of these measures, and it takes off a little bit on what Brian was just asking, which of these measures that you're proposing in terms of police reform or accountability measures are the most critical, are absolutely must do uh, this legislative session? But the first part of the question is relative to what uh, Majority Leader Paul Gazelka said on the floor today. He, he said last July, the legislature passed the most comprehensive police accountability bill that he can remember and went on to say, quote, I am still not saying we will definitely do more police accountability this next four weeks. There may be something, but I, I'm not saying we will not. I just know that we have to pass the budget bills. So I'd like to get your response to that. Well, there's a lot there. Uh, let me just uh, uh, take a quick uh, a bite. It really is difficult to say, look, there's one magic uh, bullet here. There's one uh, uh, lever that's much more important than the other. What we are recognizing is that we're talking about an entire culture of behavior. We're talking about an entire system design in which accountability uh, is pretty weak, um, in which uh, standards are incredibly subjective, which given the society that we live in, you know, where we're all impacted by racial bias, uh, usually spells trouble. So all of these pieces are meant to be reinforcing with one another. If forced uh, to pick one of these, I would say anything that constantly puts regular Minnesotans and citizens at the table to review what's going on, to comment, to even play a role in reshaping, um, uh, making decisions about how do we stop uh, uh, bad behaviors and bad systemic uh, uh, issues. So the Citizen Review Council, absolutely critically important, continuing to beef up uh, the work of the post board's ability to, to uh, design and develop that early warning system that we put into play uh, last year. Those would be two really big issues. I'll let others weigh in on the other bigger uh, question that you pose. So if I can just jump in and add to what Chair Marani said, you know, I just, first I got to address the, the comment that you said that, or the statement that um, Majority Leader Gazelka said on the floor today. I mean, I think that's part of the issue that we're having here, right? Is that we're in a moment where we need to take action and we have someone continuing to say that we're not going to take action. 
that's our community deserves more than that. Minnesotans deserve more than that. So I'd love to be bipartisan, but I also understand that this is a moment that we can't pass up. We have to take action. And the chair mentioned, right, we're looking at things where we want to make sure we enhance community oversight. I think that's an important part. It builds on that community trust. We want to make sure we improve accountability with the early warning system, collecting database, collecting data for our post board so they can intervene in situations and, uh, and stop some things maybe like what happened, maybe have a chance to intervene and stop what happened to George Floyd and stop what happened to Dante Wright. But you know what? None of that's going to happen if we continue to have one part of our legislation that says they are not going to take action when they know that in this moment, we need to take action. We cannot afford to continue to having lives lost when we can step in as legislators, do our job, do our job, serve our community and protect, save lives, and also protect our law enforcement officers who are out there doing the right thing every single day. Thank you, Representatives, appreciate it. All right, next question is from Walker Ornstein from MinPost. And he writes, how important is the measure limiting traffic stops among your priorities? And how do you respond to some GOP concerns that it's a major change that hasn't been fully vetted since it was introduced late in session and has only had two public hearings with limited outside testimony? I would say good policy is good policy, uh, no matter when it comes forward. Um, you know, something that's been lost in the discussion about this is that uh, these changes regarding traffic stops are already in place in different cities throughout the country. They are effective. They actually improve overall relations with law enforcement. It's not just about the person being pulled over. It makes the whole system work better. Um, and I, you know, my, uh, my email inbox would tell me that the public is paying attention and is weighing in. Um, and it's, uh, I also find, uh, you know, if there's any sort of uh, this is a new idea. Well, we've been spending uh, tens of hours on the House floor on amendments with new ideas uh, to the omnibus bills, and that hasn't stopped us debating those. So, again, this is good policy that's good for everybody. It's going to make the whole system work better, and it's exactly the kind of thing that we should all be working on right now. All right, next question is from Peter Callahan. Go ahead. Hi, thank you. I have a question for Speaker Cortman. It's, it's a one part question. Um, can you share with us what you can of your conversations with uh, Senator Gazelka and the governor? We, there was references to weekend conversations about the $9 million funding, but I'm curious as to whether those are those on that money, but also what you guys are talking about here, whether you're having conversations continuing since then and whether they're leading anywhere. You know, we really haven't started um, in-depth conversations of a uh, you know, that would relate to budget negotiations at all. Um, this weekend, uh, I was mainly in contact with the administration, um, asking them for very detailed information, substantiating the um, emergency request for additional public safety funding, so that I could bring that in front of our caucus as we, um, as we work with the administration to make sure that, um, you know, they have the resources they need to keep Minnesotans safe. Thank you. All right, next question is from uh, Neil McFarquhar from the New York Times. What effect, if any, do you expect the verdict to have on the public safety debate? I would, I would hope it would have a big effect um, in terms of a resolve on the part of our colleagues never ever to see this again. Uh, in our state um, and to do the hard work, quite frankly, of understanding why it does happen. I mean, quite frankly, you know, one of my uh, biggest frustrations is working with, with the Senate that doesn't even spend time talking about these issues. They don't have hearings. Um, I, I, I could not find a single hearing this entire session on the issue of police accountability. Yes, they met us last summer, uh, good for them. We led that conversation. We had pushed those bills out the year before, a whole year before um, uh, George was, was brutally killed. Uh, not one hearing in that body. You know, there's an old saying that you can't wake up someone pretending to be asleep. Uh, we need uh, our senators, our Republican majority, to live up to the expectations of the people of Minnesota 
engage and understand the issue so that we understand that verdict trial. We know that that is something that was just not limited to one person's individual behavior, but it was part of a systemic culture that allowed that individual to act with impunity for many, many years. And can I just say too that I do expect for us to have some conversation today around the verdict of Chauvin's. You know, it is important that we as lawmakers, as policymakers, understand the inequities that we see in policing today. And we must understand that the legally sanctioned systemic racism of decades and centuries ago, they still matter today. They are still happening today. And so we know that there's a legacy of public policy decisions that serve to reinforce inequalities in our justice system. And there's a legacy of resistance to advance civil rights. And so what we, you know, yes, you know, we feel a sense of a relief for this one case for George, for George Floyd. But this is bigger, so much bigger than that, because this is a, a system that is embedded in systemic racism around policing. And so I think today you will hear this conversation about the verdict and how we still have to continue to move forward in keeping public safety, keeping po policing at the forefront of how we engage with, especially the black community. If I, if I can just add, you know, we, we've seen the people pour into the streets and this, this hasn't only impacted the black community. We've seen their allies, we've seen the community rally around them and we've seen that pain pour out into the streets. And what we need more than just conversation and more than just rhetoric saying that we believe that black lives matter, we need action. We need our Senate colleagues and particularly to show, have hearings, real hearings, move bills and to show that you actually care about that black pain, that you care about black lives and that you want to stop seeing our streets filled with protesters and community members grieving because they continue to have these traumatic, painful experiences of losing lives at the hands of law enforcement. That's what we need to have. All right, time for one more question and then we got to wrap. Ricardo Lopez, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, to expand on that, I mean, it, it, it's, it doesn't seem as though, it seems as though there are sort of two ways that, are, that this issue is being looked at between Democrats and Senate Republicans. You know, I think um, something else that the Senate Majority Leader Gazelka said today was, uh, in, in, in relation to the verdict was, as we watched the verdict yesterday, I don't know anyone can say justice wasn't served. Um, but, you know, some activists have said, you know, that that the verdict does not represent justice, rather accountability and, and, and that their pursuit of, of systemic changes does not stop there. Um, you know, and, and given just sort of the remarks around Dante Wright and the, the idea of fact-finding missions or fact-finding hearings, I, I mean, is this, can you, what's sort of your reaction to this disconnect in, in what the message is from community members, from activists, from, from, from your caucus around the systemic problems and, and, and just, you know, Senate Republicans just not sharing that view? Uh, I just, I just, I just have to say, um, you have a community that is pouring their heart out, they're grieving, they're out in the streets, they're telling you that that wasn't justice. They're telling you that what that was is accountability. Accountability that they rarely see. That's what they're telling you. That's what the celebration was because they rarely see that. And they're telling you that. And no one should have, no one should have the nerve or the audacity to say that. I don't know how you cannot see that that was justice. That is someone that is not from the community. That is someone that does not have proximity to these issues. And that is someone that is truly showing you and saying that I don't really get it and I don't really care to get it. Well, you know, I, I think, you know, um, when you have not been um, a part of uh, being encountered with racism and inequities, when you have been a part of a privileged population where laws and policy practice has aligned to your value and who you are, it's hard for you to see beyond that. So I think some of our work has to be to keep systemic racism, systemic 
policies, because systemic practice at the forefront of that. And, you know, we, we, uh, we want, you know, I, I personally, you know, who a person who woke up at 430 this morning because I could not sleep, you know, because, you know, there are still a young girl in Iowa, I believe, was a young 15 year old who was killed at the same time as this uh, verdict was shared, a 15 year old teenager. And so until we can see the inequities within the system around use of force, police accountability, and that police officers have been given the inherent right to protect and serve. And, and the sanctity of life needs to be at the forefront of how they encounter communities. And so systemic racism is real. It is the foundation of America and we have to address that. We cannot move forward unless we know the history of what that is and what that looks like. And today in session, I plan to talk a little bit about that because I think it's a, con a continuous conversation about our people of color indigenous caucus, our black legislators and other really um, educating our colleagues about racism in America. You know, we, we believe they should know about it. We think they should be at the forefront of their mind, but if it's not you, what do you do about it? Do you think about it? Do you feel the pain? I would say no. And so we still have work to do. And as lawmakers, we have to know that the Jim Crow laws of the day before impact where we are today. We have to be lawmakers who take us into a 21st century policing practice. We, got to, we have to do that. We have to make up for the ills and the wrongs of yesterday. As lawmakers, it is our responsibility to take us into the future and to be informed and to be factual and to be ready to do the right thing in the 21st century, which is make sure that the dignity and the sanctity of life is at the forefront of how police are encountering our communities. I'm, I'm really proud to be part of a caucus that gets this. Um, this has been a priority for the House DFL uh, for a number of years, but I was tasked with chairing this uh, by the speaker, she was real clear with me about three years ago that this was an important priority for us. It is sad and it's tragic that that priority does not exist over in the Senate. The message from the Senate to, to black communities is that your lives don't matter. That's not what the public wants. That's why the public came out because they do want black lives to matter and they want our actions uh, and how we structure our systems and, and how we structure our laws to reflect that. And let me just add, um, law enforcement needs to be a part of that leadership as well. You know, we're not giving up on law enforcement. We're not. We're actually holding them up to a high standard. You know who you hold up to high standards? People you care about, people you count on, people you want to be part of your community. And so they need to step up as well, as opposed to constantly wrestling and struggling against um, any kind of change. I understand the fear issue, but what we need from them is to be the leaders, the co-leaders uh, with the rest of us. Last summer during the civil uh, disturbance, Paul Gazelka tweeted that he wanted to get back to Minnesota nice. And I think that is exactly the attitude that we can't afford, that somehow there was a better past when everybody was kinder to each other. That is not how Minnesota has been. Minnesota nice has been a, an excuse to not look at real problems. And I think not only is the community demanding that we continue to address real problems and a look at the racist foundations of our state, but we as legislators, we as Democrats are going to insist that looking at the reality of racism, looking at the reality of police brutality is going to remain on the agenda. We are not going to return to a fake past where people were nice, that did not exist. And we will not be able to, to move forward pretending like we don't have these problems to address. Great, thank you. All right, with that, we've got to wrap up.
Thanks, everybody. Thank you.